An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 20, July 31st, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last session, we saw how dialectic is essentially concerned with the conceptual determination of its object, and at one with the philosophical tradition in this regard establishes an interconnection between the universal concepts involved but it also recognizes a feature of these concepts which exhibits a certain freedom in contrast to traditional logical procedures. For dialectic knows that it is bound not to any process of definition, but to the matter itself, to the life at work in the concept. And so far as such conceptual determination does not appeal to definitions, it can only emerge, as I think I have indeed already pointed out to you, through the configuration, through the reciprocal interaction into which these concepts are drawn. The way in which these concepts can only properly be determined in and through this interaction with one another reveals not only the insufficiency and inadequacy of each individual concept on its own, on its own, sorry, random hiccup, but also the essentially relational character of them all. On this view, therefore, in the higher sense, there is no such thing as a partial individual truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, of all the challenges which the dialectic presents for ordinary consciousness, the notion that no such individual truth can actually be assumed, that on the contrary, there is truth only in the constellation which the quite specific individual instances of knowledge come to make up, is the hardest challenge posed by dialectical thought in relation to the usual conception of thought. And it is also precisely this dialectical challenge which is most strongly resisted by that need for security, which in its backward and regressive form possesses such extraordinary significance for our position with regard to knowledge today. Without wishing or being able to eliminate this scandalin for you in any way, I believe you will still see that we are not dealing here just with a wild claim on the part of an excessively self-reflective philosophy, Rather, we are dealing with how philosophy at this point suspends something which appears so self-evident, which has become almost second nature to thought, which has now exerted its influence over an inconceivably long period of time. For the idea that we can lay hold upon an essentially stable and reliable truth, first in individual concepts, and then in the highest generalizations and in highest fields of scientific knowledge, is itself nothing but the projection of the social division of labor upon knowledge as such, and ultimately upon metaphysics. In other words, the particular contributions to knowledge which have been facilitated through the necessary specialization of human experience in terms of highly specific roles and professions, and without which the prog progress of civilization itself would not even be conceivable, have been hypostasized into a very limited conception of intrinsically stable truth. It then comes to look as though the individual field, along with the conceptual apparatus bound up with it, were something that essentially existed in itself, while the interconnection of the concepts involved, of the areas of knowledge, and finally of the spheres of social produc production as a whole, is treated in this regard merely as a result of the interplay between these individual moments. What is actually primary thus comes to appear as something secondary, it is indeed no accident, and I am not sure whether this particular fact in the history of philosophy has ever been emphasized as much, as much as it surely deserves to be, that this specific philosophy in which the claims of limited particular truth, and above all the claims of a limited form of concept, which has been specifically developed and scrupulously distinguished from all other concepts, and the claims of definition itself, were first expressly defended namely the philosophy of Plato, is the same philosophy in which the concept of the social division of labor first express, expressly appears as an issue of political philosophy, and in which the order of ideas, the order of concepts as such, also appears in a direct relationship to this division of labor. You will encounter something rather similar in what is called Plato's psychology, and the term psychology is quite inappropriate here, with the division of the highest faculties of the soul as pure concepts, 
which are distinguished from one another in turn by reference to the different functions exercised within a city-state organized in terms of the division of labor. The much earlier philosophers, by contrast, especially the ancient Indian thinkers, but also the early pre-Socratic metaphysical thinkers, captured the moment of the particularity which belongs to the individual concept and to individual knowledge in their conception of the interdependence of all beings. But this conception, which was permeated, of course, by mythological notions of a single overarching fate, was challenged, and in a sense quite rightly challenged, by the criticisms of Greek enlightenment, and showed itself to be unsustainable in the face of more rigorous knowledge. It effectively declined as a result and now survives in an impoverished form, only in a kind of salon metaphysics, like that of Hermann Kieserling, or in certain doctrines which basically belong in the realm of cultured dilettantism, like those of C.G. Young, for example. And this, and this degeneration of philosophy into a sort of salon gossip, on the one hand, is the counterpart of the scienti scientific conception of philosophy, of its transformation into a purely specialized enterprise on the other. In truth, however, concepts do not simply become vague when they take on various meanings in specific constellations, for they are actually vague precisely when they function in a purely isolated way, and they assume genuinely determinate character only in the context of such constellations, namely the kind of determinate character and particular value which I attempted to clarify for you last time when I compared this with the process of reading stories in a foreign language without a dictionary constantly at hand. In this connection, I drew a comparison from the realm of language, and it strikes me in retrospect that this was not exactly accidental. For you can or ought to see at this point that for philosophy, or as I would prefer to say, for any kind of knowledge that could properly be regarded as scientific knowledge in accordance with the older Hegelian use of the word Wissenschaftlich, you can see that the presentation, namely what we generally call the specific language, or describe with that appalling expression as the style of the work, is not merely an addition which certain more or less aesthetically cultivated philosophical authors externally provide for their thoughts in order to prove their distance from the vulgar understanding of things which otherwise prevails. His sentences are so long. On the contrary, one must recognize that any thought which is fully aware of the consequences and implications of the dialectical approach, any thought therefore that is in earnest with dialectic, requires an emphatic form of presentation. We must recognize that it is not possible, possible here, as it is in the reified approach of the special sciences, to present a fixed content in a way that separates form and content and allows this content to be expressed in a fashion which may in a sense be described as arbitrary and irresponsible. Rather, it is the very fact that the content here is not fixed in this way, that the content first finds its meaning through the context in which its individual moments enter, namely through that whole, which I have been trying to clarify for you, which requires presentation in an emphatic sense. The circumstance implies that the whole necessarily becomes a means of grasping the matter itself, becomes a category of cognition. And this finds expression in the way, on the one hand, the vigor and accuracy with which the linguistic formulation captures the individual aspect that is intended in each case is precisely what leads the concept most effectively into the overall context, while, on the other hand, the construction of the whole bestows a specific meaning on the concept right down to the grammatical construction of individual propositions, realizes through the medium of language that the concretization of the concept, that concretization of concepts in a specific context, which as I have already suggested, is precisely what breathes something of that life into concepts, which definitions would dearly like to instill, but in truth merely serve to expel. In other words, we must recognize that philosophy, insofar as it is not concerned simply with the communication of a fixed and finished content, insofar as, on the contrary, it consists essentially in the conceptual self-reflection of the matter itself, 
is constitutively bound up with its mode of presentation. It is not some quirk, therefore, as I tried to show in more detail in my little piece on the essayist form. If philosophical writers who are to be taken seriously are as serious about language as we have become, at least since Schopenhauer, who was the first to address this stratum of philosophy explicitly. And similarly, it is an undeniable measure of the ossification or abandonment of the inner dialectical movement of thought when the latter ceases to be concerned with a specific form of its linguistic expression. You can recognize something of the kind in Scheller, for example, where the irresponsible journalistic tone bellies the ontological pathos of this philosophy, or again, in the later Lucas, whose total indifference to matters of linguistic expression corresponds to that simple repetition or duplica duplication of a dogmatically ossified doctrine, which is also quite appropriate to the content of his thought. I would just like to say something else about the problem of presentation here, namely that it is only the process of presentation which allows thought to go beyond the merely pre-given character that a concept already brings with it. I have attempted to show you that the concepts I employ as such already have a certain content, that they are not simply counters, that they are rather something which I must, in a sense, obey. Insofar as I offer a resistance to these concepts through the process of presentation, insofar as I employ them in such a way that, the, that they express precisely that and only that which I want to express with them, there's a sense in which I challenge the blind power of what they bring with them, and this facilitates that communication between the mere opaque objectivity of conceptual meaning and the subjective intention in which the life of these concepts actually consists. But the distinctive feature of presentation in the medium of language lies in the way that this contribution of subjectivity, which transpires wherever presentation lays hold of its concepts in an emphatic sense, is not in turn an arbitrary matter does not simply spring from the mere caprice or particular taste of the singular individual, but itself contains in turn a moment of objectivity, which is first mediated, mediated through subjectivity over against the rigid and merely pre-given objectivity of the concept. I am talking about the objectivity which is involved in the way that the concept must grasp what it is meant to grasp as precisely as possible. And this is an essential function of presentation, while the demands which I make upon my object through the process of presentation are demands which spring not from some merely subjective caprice, but effectively arise from the discipline of language itself. Thus, insofar as I follow the postulates of language, insofar as I take up the concept of virtue by virtue of language, and indeed attempt thereby to realize my subjective intention, I still do so in such a way that, through the subject, I also bring out that objectivity which is indeed necessarily involved in the logic of language and the rigor it demands. I would say that this is the epistemological function of presentation, and this is how I would like you to understand it. Of those definitions, which are only true as long as we already have a grasp of the matter itself, as long as we constantly insist that all philosophical questions are essentially questions of formulation in a higher sense. The problem of formulation furnishes the specific perspective, the specific sight, as it were, where what we can call the dialectic of subject and object is effectively realized in the context of philosophical argument. This brings me to the question of the relationship between the dialectic and specific logical forms, an issue about which I would like to say at least something here. For in our discussion of definition, in individual concepts, we have already been talking about one of these fundamental logical forms. The two other fundamental logical forms, as you presumably all know, are the structures of judgment and inference. What we mean by a judgment, if I may start by offering you this standard account, and in fact we sometimes have to employ such definitions in order to be able to challenge them in some way later on, what we mean by a judgment in the context of philosophy is a linguistically formulated assertion with regard to which the question of truth or falsity can meaningfully be raised. While what we mean by an inference is a relationship of propositions or judgments whose validity is supposed to consist in the interdependent relation between them, 
I believe, and maybe I can repeat this today at the end of these lectures in order to make it a little easier for some of you who have found this otherwise difficult to follow, that perhaps the fundamental thing, the simple and elementary thing from which the process of dialectical thought begins is this. While it is indeed the case that without judgments or to use the traditional language, without the syntheses accomplished between a subject or subject concept, a predicate concept and a cupola, cupola, namely the is where A is B, furnishes the fundamental form of a judgment. There's no such thing as knowledge in an emphatic sense. It is also the case that the judgment itself or every singular judgment is problematic in character. And it is this contradiction which perhaps provides the most drastic motive of all for dialectical thinking. If we do not make judgments, in other words, if we do not subsume certain givens um, or other under certain concepts or other, then no knowledge is possible. Further and above all, we can advance beyond mere tautology only if by means of some judgment we place something which is into relation to something else with which it is not itself immediately identical. That is to say, we perform a certain act of identification. We can only make objects our own. We can only admit them into the native realm of truth, as Hegel puts it, inasmuch as we identify them, namely, as we identify them, namely, identify them with ourselves. That is to say, make them the same as ourselves, make what is unknown into something that is, in a certain sense, already known to us. And it is perhaps one of the most painful experiences we must encounter when we engage in philosophy, that while our entire pathos in this regard, our entire labor and effort is dedicated specifically to the task of expressing what we do not already know, what is not already present for us, we nonetheless find ourselves driven again and again to express what it is we wish to express by rendering it the same in some sense. That is, by reducing what is new to what is already known, what is already given, thus every kind of theory with regard to what it, es what it essentially intends comes to assume that distinctively deadened, rigid, and reductive character which makes the conclusion of any particular philosophical work into such an awkward and difficult business for the individual who had to undertake it, an experience which you will find expressed most vividly by Nietzsche, if memory serves me right, in the final aphorism from beyond good and evil. I have thereby already also anticipated the negative moment that is involved in the notion of a judgment, and I might add that this negative moment also has in fact a very precise logical place of its own, for there is something untrue even at this in this simple act of subsumption, which I must perform if I am to arrive at something like truth, at the idea of truth itself. We were already agreed, if I may presume as much after providing you with this definition, that in the first instance a judgment is precisely something to which the question of truth is in principle applicable. On the other hand, it is also the case that a certain double untruth is involved in every judgment as long as you take it simply as an isolated judgment. If you say A is B, this always necessarily implies on the one hand that A is identified with something with which it is not entirely identical, something under which it falls with respect to some moments or features, whereas it remains distinct with respect to others. Otherwise, we would simply be stuck with the proposition A is A rather than A is B, and that is a purely analytical proposition and would therefore not be a judgment at all in any emphatic sense. On the other hand, however, it is also the case that the predicate concept too, under which the subject concept is brought, precisely through its incomparably incom greater range or extension with respect to the individual instance which I bring under it, cannot possibly be identified with the individual thing in question. In a strict sense, an individual thing is not identical with its concept but falls under that concept. In other words, you will have recognized at this point the paradox that the very form through which the concept or the idea of truth springs, and without which it would be meaningless to speak of truth, for nothing that is devoid of apophantic form, that is to say nothing which is not a judgment or a complex of judgment, could be described as true, 
that this form is at the same time, in its very essence, also necessarily afflicted with untruth. And seen from this perspective, dialectic is actually nothing but a desperate effort to heal this untruth in the form of truth itself. Thus, dialectic is the attempt to arrive at truth through the form of its own untruth. You could also pursue this in another way precisely by looking at the theory of judgment, about which I have been able to offer you only these rather desultory remarks today, specifically from the perspective of subject and object. For on the one hand, what you are engaged in here is what is described in the traditional language of philosophy as synthesis. You are relating and bringing together moments which were not previously connected with one another in just this way. For synthesis, namely this relating of diverse moments, which thought accomplishes, is indeed precisely the necessary subject, subjective side that is involved in any judgment. On the other hand, the truth claim implied in the judgment itself depends on the in eliminable assumption that there is precisely something in the state of affairs affirmed in the judgment itself which actually belongs together. Thus, when you judge 2 plus 2 is 4, the very sense of this judgment is impossible without the synthesis accomplished in consciousness insofar as the latter enacts the multiplication, namely insofar as it duplicates the concept 2 as such. But the proposition is true only if there is actually also something in the matter itself, such that 2 plus 2 is 4. Now, of course, you may say, that is all very well. I have two moments here. On the one hand, I bring something together. On the other hand, there are two things that are already connected with one another. So on the one side, there would be the mere form of the judgment. And on the other side, there would be the matter, as phenomenology describes it, namely the state of affairs itself, which is judged. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, we have to say, and here once again I can offer you a glimpse, as it were, into the hidden life of the dialectic, that the issue is by no means so simple and straightforward. For, while it is certainly possible to distinguish these two moments and say, if you do not have both these, these moments, then there is no such thing as a judgment, then there is no such thing as the truth of judgment, it is nonetheless impossible, even as you distinguish them to, separate them, to separate these moments clinically from one another, as if with a scalpel. You cannot say this is the mere form in the judgment, and that is the mere content in the judgment. For unless you accomplish the aforementioned synthesis qua subject, you cannot be conscious of the state of affairs that is being judged, and which underlies the judgment in question. And unless, on the other hand, the synthesis relates to such a state of affairs, that is, unless it finds support in the material itself, it cannot arise at all. In other words, the subjective or noetic side of the judgment, as the phenomenologists call it, and the objective or nomadic side of the judgment do not stand opposed to one another, specifically as form and content, respectively, but are recipro reciprocally mediated one with the other. <coughs> You may say, therefore, that the dialectic of subject and object, the reciprocal self-production of the subjective and objective moments, can actually be recognized even in the situation of a judgment, which appears so form formal, logical, in character. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you will perhaps allow me in these final minutes, standing on one leg, as it were, to say something else to you here, something more fundamental about the relationship between dialectic and logic, something that goes beyond what I said to you earlier on when I pointed out that dialectical thought invariably presupposes the validity of the logical forms themselves, even though there is also a sense in which it must also go beyond the validity of the latter. For you may say, through our categorical system, through the structure of those categories which we gather together under the name of logical categories, we have, a foist, we have foisted a kind of net over the entire world, and without this net we cannot know anything at all about the world, and it is absurd to assume that there is some immediate consciousness of the truth, which would not in itself simultaneously presuppose this net, would not in itself presuppose these logical forms, and it would not really be difficult to show even the most extreme defenders of intuitionism, such as Henry Bergson, 
that even when they attempt to deal solely with their intuitions, in actuality, these very intuitions continue to involve the whole logical apparatus. At the same time, however, what I have just tried to make clear to you in a rather drastic way in the context of our analysis of the judgment also holds for absolutely everything that is logically mediated, namely that this logical apparatus is inadequate to the life of the matter itself and not inadequate in the merely rhetorical sense in which conventional souls love to declare on Sundays that logic cannot do justice to the world and that on Sunday at least, feeling is all that is left to us. Rather, it is inadequate in the more rigorous, precise, and unsentimental sense that the same logic which first allows us to know the world simultaneously shows itself in terms of its own meaning and object as always also false, as also always internally contradictory. Now, now, and as much as the dialectic specifically grasps these things of which I have spoken to you today, of which I have been speaking throughout these lectures, and as much as it reflects upon these things and expressly tries to, to bring them to consciousness, it is effectively attempting to square the circle, as it were, to carry off the feet of Munchausen. And while I admit that it is highly questionable whether this can successfully be achieved, it perhaps still represents the only chance that the claim to knowledge possesses at all. For dialectic is the attempt to break out of the prison of logic, to break free of the compulsive character of logic, in which indeed the compulsive character of society is comparably reflected, just as the primordial form of a judgment is that which condemns to death, but certainly not to break out in a merely declamatory, archaizing way somehow imagining that we can appeal to a pre-logical dimension as the immediately true and substantial, although the latter would thereby be consigned to a realm of chaos. Rather, the course of logic must be challenged by appeal to its own means, challenged therefore by bringing logic itself, concretely in relation to all of its determinations, to an explicit consciousness of its own insufficiency, allowing it to disintegrate through its own power. And the power which accomplishes this disintegration, this negative power of the concept in the Hegelian sense, this essentially critical power is indeed in truth identical with the concept of truth itself. This is ultimately the heart of every form of dialectic, insofar as dialectic itself can still be conceived in philosophical terms, and not just inevitably and invariably in relation to praxis. This attempt to remedy the injustice of logic with its own means, as it were, or if you like, to help do justice to nature by recourse to the moments involved in its own organized domination, and in the first place to do it justice in the context of mind or spirit. This, I would claim, is the central motive which ultimately inspires dialectical thought itself, without which such thought cannot be understood at all. And in this regard, precisely in the spirit of Hegel's logic, it calls upon that power which stands against truth, namely the power of untruth. This disintegration of traditional logic by logical means is brought about not by some external critique of these logical means, but solely by an imminent demonstration that, in each case measured by these own standards, they are inadequate to the truth. I may point out in passing that similar considerations apply to the forms of inference. I believe that a reformulation of the dialectical critique of the forms of inference would be an essential task for a fresh account of dialectical logic, something which, in the sense I have in mind, has never been accomplished as yet. Remarkably enough, however, we can certainly find the rudiments for such a critique of inf inferential procedure in the ph phenomenological tradition, which in many respects of course, actually represents one of the most advanced epistemological positions of modern bourgeois thought. And while I may have touched upon this aspect in my metacritique of epistemol epistemology, it has not yet been developed as fully as it demands to be, which is why I specifically wish to remind you of this here. Phenomenology could also be understood in a certain sense as a critique of inf inferential procedure. To begin with, I would like to describe the motivation behind this critique precisely as we find it in phenomenology itself. 
Now, phenomenology certainly commits the mistake of believing that we are actually dealing with immediate intuitions, even when in truth we are talking about arguments, that is to say about kinds of inference. It seems to me that this mistake has indeed been sufficiently established, and I feel it is almost superfluous to insist upon it any longer. Yet the underlying phenomenological impulse here is none other than to show with regard to specific cognition which grasps its object, which is appropriate to its object, how the relationship to other cognitions is not a matter of earlier and later, the cognitions of whatever kind do not actually stand in merely inferential or formal logical relations to one another. In accordance with our earlier critique of the idea of a first ground or principle in philosophy, or indeed of a final ground or principle, for both are essentially correlative, one must also claim that any hierarchy of propositions, namely any relations of priority in which one would found or be founded in turn by another, is not ultimately compelling. And if you consider for a moment that the theory of inference, if we ignore the issue of induction here, is in fact essentially essentially formal, logical in character, i.e. basically aims to show how various propositions are contained in one another, then the hierarchical relation of major and minor premises becomes doubly problematic. For it is by no means easy to see why any of the propositions which are conceived as containing one another should enjoy an absolute priority over any other. Insofar as phenomenology specifically attempted to furnish descriptions, in place of logical inferences and arguments, it also gave expression, without being clearly aware of this, to the notion that formal argumentation in comparison with the reciprocal constellation of thoughts has something arranged and artificial about it, something which it is precisely one of the tasks of philosophy itself to remedy. I would say, therefore, that while any philosophy which does justice to its own idea must certainly avail itself of argumentation in a critical sense, it should be directed not towards argumentation itself, but towards the dissolution of such argumentation. And George Simmel's observation that anything that can be proved can also be disputed, and that only the unprovable is indisputable, actually possesses a stronger meaning than it was supposed to have in this specific context, namely that of a psychological relativism, in which Simmel himself originally defended it. If I may simply remind you for a moment how thin and arbitrary are the arguments that are generally introduced in philosophical writings as intermediate concepts between what we might call the theses in question and how much, even in Kant, for example, that which serves the specific domain of argumentation actually reveals itself merely as a kind of ar architectonic bridge as a device for sustaining the overall systematic structure, then you will clearly understand what I mean by the dissolution of argumentation in this context. This too, and here I come back to the issue which I actually wanted to talk about in our session today, is essentially a question of presentation. And speaking for my part, I would say that the particular kind of dense and concentrated expression, which I strive for, with perhaps questionable success, is not somehow designed to do away with argumentation. One cannot do that anyway, and you could easily produce a hundred arguments from writings of my own, but rather is designed to challenge the traditional distinction between thesis or assertion and argumentation, and thus the traditional form of inferential reasoning for those reasons of principle which I have tried to present to you or for you. And if the relationship between thoughts is indeed to be conceived not as a hierarchy, but as a constellation, then methodologically speaking, we must recognize the demand that every thought is equally, equally close to the center, that there are really no such things as bridging concepts or theses and conclusions derived from them. For every individual proposition is imbued with the power of argument or reflective thought, as well as the power to grasp the matter itself with precision and the ideal of philosophy, which cannot indeed be redeemed by thought, would be to express in its very form that philosophy is concerned not with assertions and demonstrations, but solely with a truth which presents itself in the construction of the whole, and where every word, every proposition, every syntactic stru structure 
must in a sense bear the same responsibility as any other. When I said to you that dialectic is in a certain sense a critique of the, pedi of the pedantry of thought, this is an example of what I mean. And I believe that if you are in, er in earnest with dialectical thought, then the form of presentation you adopt insofar as it effectively dispenses with the traditional approach which claims to demonstrate certain assertions is a good indication of whether you are actually thinking dialectically, namely whether the content intended in the thought and the enactment of the thought itself attain that identification which is called for. I am quite aware, ladies and gentlemen, that, that this lecture, perhaps more than any other, has proved something of a patchwork, as is effectively unavoidable, especially if one undertakes to engage with the dialectic without being an idealist. Dialectic here is a form of thought which speaks of constellation, of interconnection, of the whole, even while it cannot claim any confident grasp on such a whole, for it is indeed nothing simply at its disposal, where one cannot say, as in Hegel, that subject and object, by virtue of the process they undergo, are ultimately one and the same. And in presenting such a philosophy, and especially given the inadequacies which freely improvised spoken lectures inevitably involve, all we can do is emphasize that fragmentary character, which is perhaps the only form in which dialectical thought is possible today. And to that extent, here at the end, I also discover something like an ideology for the inadequacies of what I've been saying to you. But I would not like to let you go in conclusion without at least giving you something even in withholding it from you. And as much as I would like you to consider the question whether such an assumption of identity can be avoided at all, or as I might perhaps express it, whether something like knowledge is possible at all without the assumption that subject and object are ultimately not wholly unlike one another, or whether in for forbidding the thought of such a possibility in a radically completed enlightenment, we do not thereby perhaps forbid ourselves knowledge itself, and then through this very enlightenment, and then through this very enlightenment, fall back into the darkest form of mythology. This is a hard nut that I leave with you to crack, but the vacation is indeed also a long one and perhaps you will be able to engage effectively with this problem for yourselves. For the rest, I would simply like to thank you for your attention throughout these lectures, which have often proved something of a rough road, and sincerely wish you a most enjoyable vacation, in the hope at least that I may see many of you again for the lecture series on aesthetics in the next semester. My thanks to you all.